All right. Well, God bless you this morning. The children are are going to their their classes, and again, I just uh, want to bring a quick announcements here, and then we're going to have uh, Sylvia Croft come and and share with us, and it's going to be a real blessing. Uh, I, I want we're going to we're having a service for Dina Saturday morning here at 10 o'clock, okay, June the 7th at 10 o'clock, all right, there will be a memorial service for her, and uh, Mabel will probably be calling some of you, we're going to uh, feed the family, friends, and people coming from out of state, Dina's father's flying in, her sister, uh, many people are coming in, and so uh, we're going to try to have a dinner for their family over there afterwards, but this is a good time to come and support uh, uh, Joey, and uh, I know that uh, he is wanting to see his church family here Saturday, so we would appreciate if you would come. The Bible says to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. So, and we're going to rejoice. We have Braxton. She uh, graduated from high school last night. So, Brittany, that's one down and two to go. <laughs> Okay, so we're rejoicing with Braxton. Uh, wanted to uh, just, again, keep Pastor and the team in your prayers because it is raining quite a bit, but they are working diligently, and uh, as they are working, they are ministering. And, and uh, Pastor called this morning, and uh, just the sound of his voice um, was wonderful. And uh, he is always so up and so good and, and just blessed the service this morning and blessed all of you. So Sylvia uh, has been active. What is going on in our school board? I uh, wanted to read something here. Okay. Just to kind of set this up a little bit. Some of us, I know, do not have children, and we're not as aware of what's going on in our school board, but there is a real spiritual warfare going on, a real spiritual warfare. And um, a lot of times, uh, that's what the body of Christ is for, because some of us, I am busy uh, with a lot of other things here at New Beginnings and some of the things that we're doing, and God has called Sylvia. Uh, she didn't call herself that God has really called Sylvia to the forefront. And uh, she has been uh, up there in the school board meetings and bringing the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ and standing for it. And she has had, uh, she's not been welcomed with open arms because, again, we are in a spiritual battle. And... Uh, we need to be uh, we need to be knowing what is going on here in, in our even if you do not have school children, this is still our responsibility as citizens and if, as this these are these are going to be our future as that we were ta I was talking to Sylvia these are going to be our future voters, our future leaders and uh, so we need to fight. It says Moses' father-in-law once told him that he must be the people's representative, before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how to behave. But select capable men, men from all, all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, and who hate dishonest gain. Appoint them as officials over a hun thousands, hundreds, and tens. As in our area and in our Orange Park in Clay County, we need to select capable candidates who fear God, who hate dishonest gain, and we need to appoint officials. We have a right to vote, and it is a civic duty. We had Corey put on the marquee out here last week the price of freedom is blood. 
the price of the gospel, the price of anything is not going to be uh, just us just doing whatever we want and, and hoping that it all turns out okay. We, we've had enough of that. We've got to be in tune. We've got to know what's going on. I marvel at some people that never even watch the news. I mean, they, don't, they don't even know what's going on. Pastor always says, keep your eye on Israel. D do you know what's going on over there? Um, we need to be. That is our Christian responsibility and we are just going along. I don't know what we're doing. We're going to work. We're coming home, uh, mowing the yards and uh, enjoying life here and there. And that's nothing wrong with that. But we need to be aware of our times. We need to be aware of what's going on. And so today, Sylvia, come on up. As we're just Everybody just welcome Sylvia Croft. Again, Corey said, Pastor... Last week was boots on the ground. That means the front lines. Well, this lady has been on boots on the ground, and she's going to share with you um, a lot of things that she's been experiencing and a lot of things that you need to know. Okay? God bless you. Praise the Lord. America, America. God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. How many of you love America? I see your hands. How many of you believe that God has his hand on this country and he has since its beginning? And he has been the most powerful force in shaping her. How many of you believe that? Those of you who raised your hands are absolutely correct. Because from its very beginnings, America has had God's hand on her. And on the people he used to find her and to shape her. I'm going to give you kind of a little history lesson before we get started, and I hope that you can hear it and take it to heart and hear God's heart in it. In 1492, when Christopher Columbus, whose name means Christ-bearer, began his journey to discover the new world, he did so being led of God. Let me read you just a little bit of an excerpt from his diary. He says... It was the Lord who put it into my mind. I could feel his hand on me. The fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. I am a most noteworthy sinner, that I have cried out to the Lord for grace and mercy, and they have covered me completely. I have found the sweetest consolation since I made it my whole purpose to enjoy his marvelous presence. For the execution of the voyage to the Indies, I did not make use of intelligence, mathematics, or maps. It is simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. No one should fear to undertake any task in the name of our Savior if it is just and if the intention is purely for his holy service. The working out of all things has been assigned to each person by our Lord, but it all happens according to his sovereign will, even though he gives advice. Oh, what a gracious Lord who desires that people should perform for him those things for which he holds himself responsible. Day and night, moment by moment, everyone should express their most devoted gratitude to him. Wow. 
Does that sound like what we hear the school books teach our children about Christopher Columbus? The next big move on the scene was in 1620 when the pilgrims came here aboard the Mayflower. As they sat on board the Mayflower, anchored in what is now Provincetown Harbor at the northern tip of Cape Cod, they drew up the first governing document of the Plymouth Colony. We call it the Mayflower Compact. It was signed aboard the ship by 41 of the ship's 101 passengers. It reads in part like this. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do these by solemn and mutually present in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends so stated. And by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony. Again, that first settlement for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And for those reasons, they had to draw up laws and ordinances and bind themselves together as a civil body politic. That's what our government's all about, guys. You might recognize a few of the, the names of those who signed this, by the way. John Carver, William Bradford, Edward Winslow, William Brewster, Isaac Allerton, and Miles Standish, among others. We don't hear about those in school history books anymore either. Matter of fact, when it mentions the Mayflower Compact, every word that I read to you minus anything to do with God is all that's in your kid's school book. Now let's jump ahead to July the 4th, 1776. Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the clauses or causes which impel them to the separation. This is the cause why we separated from Great Britain. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's why we have a government. And listen to this. Those governments instituted among men derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's us. When our founders met to deliberate what form of government we were going to have at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, they held those deliberations in strict secrecy. Anxious citizens were gathered outside Independence Hall waiting for a decision to come out from that meeting. 
and when it ended, the answer was provided immediately. A Mrs. Powell of Philadelphia asked Benjamin Franklin, Well, doctor, what, do we, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? With no hesitation, whatever Franklin said, a republic, if you can keep it. Now, why is that important? Because in a republic, which means law, the individual is protected from a mob rule, which is what a pure democracy means. Democracy means mob rule. Now, democracy can get pretty hairy if you have two wolves and a lamb trying to figure out what they're going to have for dinner. You know, sometimes the majority isn't always, doesn't always give the best answer. The majority crucified Jesus Christ. But our founders gave us a system where we have a separation of powers to protect us from any one branch of government getting so powerful or any one person getting so powerful that we find ourselves under a tyrant. We have a legislative branch, which is the Congress and the Senate. And their job is to confirm or reject presidential appointments. And they have the authority to declare war. And they are the only ones who have the authority to write law. Then we have the executive branch, which is the president and vice president and his cabinet. He has... He's supposed to make sure that those laws are executed, put into effect, and, and, and handled. And then last, we have the judicial branch, which is the courts and the Supreme Court and all the local courts and all the federal courts. And they have the responsibility to apply law to individual cases and to make sure if a law violates the Constitution. Now, when you hear all the stuff about how nothing's getting done because one branch or the other won't let things get through, don't be upset because that's what they're supposed to do. Their job, each of those branches, co-equal branches, are supposed to be watching the other branches to make sure that they are observing what our Constitution says and that laws aren't coming through that go against that. So just keep that in mind. They're doing their job. Now the founders knew, this is very important, they knew the dangers of a too powerful government because they understood the fallen nature of man. The government is not our friend. They're our, they're supposed to be our servant. And when they get out of hand and they get it backwards, they become a powerful enemy. So we are responsible to remind them that they work for us. We don't work for them. And I think that that's what started opening my eyes that something was really wrong. Because I would go to school board meetings or county commission meetings and they have no respect for the citizens. They talk down to you. They don't care about what you're saying and they don't want to hear it. You can speak for 10 minutes in a school board meeting and they never look at you while you're speaking. And when you finish pouring out your heart, they say, thank you, Mrs. Croft. No comment, nothing. But these founders knew about a too powerful government. They'd lived under tyrants and dictators most of their lives. And a couple of years after the Constitution was written and put into effect, our founders came together again to add some important amendments in what we call the Bill of Rights. And I'm not going to go through all those. But I want to tell you about the first one. Because... The very first amendment made sure that the federal government could not declare a state religion. You see, in England, the king or the queen was the head of the church. 
whatever religion the king or queen practiced, everybody else was in big trouble. When the king changed, if the religion of the king changed, then those who had been enjoying peace and prosperity became the persecuted. And our founders were emphatic that that would not be the case here. America's pattern of government, but let me just tell you first, the, second, the First Amendment. The First Amendment guarantees the right of free speech, the right of a free press, and I think most importantly, for the government not to make a state religion and for them not to keep us from freely practicing ours. And that's not happening. How many of you have noticed that Christians are under attack right now? Yes, I, I mean, uh, in, uh, see, two years ago in the Clay County school system, a pastor who had been going to three different schools one time a week each and meeting with parents and children who wanted to pray before school started was given notices of trespass and told if he showed his face at any of those schools again he'd be arrested. That was Pastor Ron Baker of Russell Baptist Church here in Clay County. He was accused of being a predator of trying to take advantage of the children and this was by two pastors, two other pastors, two lady pastors of Methodist churches somewhere in, in Clay County. The head of the Americans United for Separation of Church and State in the Clay County chapter said he was just trying to get in there and influence our kids. Oh, I said, oh, that men like Brother Baker could get in the school system and, and influence our kids. America has, I mean, God has a lot to say about government in his word. For instance, our three-part government, the legislative, the judicial, and the executive, comes right out of the word of God. In Isaiah 33:22, it says that the Lord is our judge, he's our lawgiver, and he's our king. And it is he who will save us. And I was going to read that scripture Susie read about select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And then just in general, Proverbs 29:2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. Proverbs 14.34 Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. America was exceptional because she was under God. Because of her constitution and her form of government. Because of her morality and her generosity and the freedom and responsibility of the individual. This is hard for me to say, but as King David lamented when he heard that Saul and Jonathan had fallen in battle, oh, how the mighty has fallen. And where was the church? Where were God's people? Where were we while America was falling? Where was the church in 1962 when one woman by the name of Madeline Murray O'Hare went on a crusade against God and had prayer removed from all the public schools? Where were we? When I was in public school up through junior high, every morning in homeroom, we all stood and pledged allegiance to the flag, then a scripture was read over the sound system, and then we all prayed the Lord's Prayer out loud together in a public school. How does something that went on for tens and tens and tens of years suddenly become unconstitutional? Something that went on since our founding 
the ones who wrote the Constitution, how did it go from being what we were supposed to do to being against the law? If you're a school teacher and you get caught talking about God to your kids or one of them complains or they go home and tell mama or daddy and they complain, you can lose your job. What's wrong with that picture? A line has been crossed in America that we may not be able to turn back. We've opened the door to homosexuality, not only being tolerated, but being celebrated. And now we're expected to also agree with it. It's not enough that it's tolerated. We have to agree. And along with that came same-sex marriage. And if you disagree with your mouth in a public arena, you get death threats. If they complain to your boss, you can lose your job. Are you aware that in every school system in this country, nothing derogatory can be said about homosexuality? It must be held up as a viable alternative lifestyle. And in many school systems already, the curriculum incorporates such things as contributions by gays in American history. Books are read to children as young as kindergarten with titles like Susie Has Two Mommies or Johnny Has Two Daddies. And Disney has a kids show on TV every week called Good Luck Charlie. Any of you guys know that program? Well, they've introduced a lesbian couple with a child and it all and and it shows the parents of this little girl and parents of other children all getting together and deciding how well they're just like us. Did you know that same-sex marriage is legal already in 14 states and judges are ruling that laws in other states against it are unconstitutional and overthrowing them? Listen, Florida is in line. Don't think that it's not going to be that here. There are people who make fun of the argument of the slippery slope. But think about this. First it was acceptance of homosexuality, toleration. Then it was defining them as a new minority group with special protections. Then it was the legalization of same-sex marriage. And now the focus is on consensual adult-child sexual relations. That's what the new push is on now. Groups mostly headed by homosexuals like NAMBLA, North American Man-Boy Love Association. And yes, that is a, a, I don't think it's 501c3, but it's a non-profit American organization. They're pushing for laws to legalize those relations. They say it's unfair to keep children from experiencing this. Every This is one of the things they said. Every young boy would benefit from a relationship with an older caring man. And you know what kind of relationship they're talking about. We're killing babies at the rate of 5,000 a day in this country. What do you think God thinks about all this? Everything that we have just discussed, and there's so much more, I could take two or three hours and tell you what's going on in this country that if my granddaddy was still alive, he'd have had his shotgun and gone to Washington, D.C. and handled some stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you. He didn't put it, hey, he wouldn't even let me wear lipstick in front of him. He washed my face out under the kitchen sink one day, told me I better not ever show up looking like that again. <laughs> it was, I was so shocked. <laughs> he messed up my makeup and my hair that day. <clears throat> 
But everything we've just discussed all came about by godless men and women that we elected who made and passed laws to uphold it. And whether we vote for people with those kind of values or we don't vote at all, we're still accountable for who's in office because that's the kind of government we have. We're not like other nations. And we don't just get whatever government that we have pushed or chosen for us. God gave this nation to his own people to be stewards over for him. We were supposed to make sure that we brought him honor and glory through her and that we advance the kingdom of God. And we not only have the right to choose who makes the laws and executes them and judges them, we have the responsibility. In 1 Corinthians 4.2, God says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. In 1961, Ronald Reagan said this, Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Do you realize that? Just because we have been free does not mean we will be free. Free, he also said, freedom isn't something you have. It's something you keep that you have to guard. In America, we have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that means that we, the people, are the ones accountable and responsible for who gets into office and what those people do once they're in. We're the ones that God is going to hold responsible for what happens in America. That's why I'm fighting hard. I don't want him to look at me and say, how come you kept your mouth shut? How come you never said anything? How come you didn't go vote? How come you didn't make sure who you were voting for and what they believed? The people who get into office, if you don't think that you have any responsibility for all this and you just don't want to be bothered with it, think about it this way. The people who get into office directly affect the lives of your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your grandparents, your friends, and yourselves. The laws they pass will either be for their good or for their harm. And it's all up to you and me. Yet countless millions of Christians in the West take absolutely no interest in what's happening in our government and don't know anything about how it's supposed to work. And there's a large percentage of Christians who aren't even registered to vote. That means that we will allow any and every evil and godless person to be in a place of authority over us and our children. How could we have that attitude? In a country that God gave us such freedom. You know, you never have freedom without great responsibility. Freedom and responsibility go hand in hand. In other countries where all of a sudden they get a right to vote, people brave other people with guns trying to kill them before they can go vote. They line up hours and hours ahead of time to be able to vote. It's a precious treasure. And we don't appreciate it like we should. Ignorance is not a virtue. In fact, when we aren't living up to our responsibility, it is sin. If God is concerned about government, then doesn't it follow that we should be too? At a minimum, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not used to doing this on this high day where, at a minimum, we need to be aware of what's going on 
and vote prayerfully and carefully for those that are most consistent with our biblical principles. Listen, you better quit worrying about the economy and you better worry about morality and the killing of babies. Guess what? God is the one who blesses, but he won't do it with the stuff going on that's going on here. We're in the trouble we are economically because of what we're doing morally. So if we want to get the economy right, we better repent. And we better start doing what we're supposed to do about making sure the right people are running things. We cannot afford to just vote for whatever party we belong to. Let me tell you something. This is not about party. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever else there is out there. None of those parties can save America. Only God can save America. But what you need to do is out of all of those parties, you need to look for able men, godly men, men who hate unjust gain, men who are against abortion, men who believe that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. That's who you better be looking for. Don't get caught in a party. A party will kill you. The opportunity to help select the kind of government we will have is a stewardship that God entrusts to us as citizens of this nation. And we should not fail to appreciate it. We should not neglect it. If we keep waiting around to do something, you may wait until it's just too late. I hope it's not too late already. I don't care if it is, I'm still going to fight. That's the attitude you got to have. Because God said, the Lord said, occupy till I come. He also said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Well, he's going to find me fighting. How about you? You need to go to a few school board meetings. You need to see what's going on there. Because you'll be shocked. You will be shocked at the nasty, rotten, hateful stuff that is done and said. You can go to the school board or the school district website and click on One Clay Vision, I think it is, or One Clay something. It's a link. And you can watch it live while it's going on. It's the third Thursday night of every month. And it starts at 7 o'clock. And if you see a banner under the Clay County seal, this banner that became part of the seal a few months ago says, In God We Trust. Me and another guy, and it was really his idea, said we need to fight for that. By gosh, it says it on our money, and, and we need to push them in a corner and make them say they either don't want anything to do with God or they'll do it. And so we did. We got hard about it. And guess what? They decided to shut us up. They put that, that on the seal. Praise the Lord. I want you to hear one more thing, and I'm going to close pretty quickly. I want you to understand the impact of your vote. We've all heard the adage, what you reap is what you sow, meaning actions or inactions, because they have results and sometimes consequences. The same can be said for your vote on election day. One vote can have a ripple effect for years to come. Often when we prepare to cast our vote for a candidate for president or senate, we forget that these future elected leaders will determine the judges who sit on our nation's federal courts. And in states where judges aren't elected, the governor and state legislature are usually involved. To put this into perspective, consider this statistic. Over the course of eight years, a two-term president will appoint around one-third of the nation's 900 federal judges to fill positions left vacant by either attrition or retirement. That's roughly 300 
unelected, unaccountable federal judges who rule on a range of issues that impact your daily life, including your religious freedom. And not all federal judges hold to the same philosophy we do, not by a long shot. Conservatives generally favor judges who believe in the U.S. Constitution being interpreted to mean what the founders understood it to mean. Liberals, however, often favor judges who believe in a living Constitution. And that means that it's interpreted of the light, in the light of changing trends and changing morality. These two judicial philosophies are in direct conflict. A recent example of this tug of war happened in the town of Greece, New York, where the U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed the right of city councils and other public bodies to begin their meetings with prayer. That decision was by a razor thin majority of five to four. See how important one vote can be? One vote. Within the next few weeks, and this is coming up very quickly, the Supreme Court justices will once again rule on another important religious freedom issue. In the Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood specialties cases, anybody heard of those? The justices will decide whether business owners must give up their religious rights when they decide to earn a living, when they start a business. Will we be in for another five to four ruling? And will the ruling be in favor of religious freedom? We don't know. Our religious freedom should not be subject to the whims of judges. But it's going to take all of us to take up the challenge of securing our freedom for this and future generations. It's up to us, guys. You know, I think that this whole idea that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics started with my grandparents. That's about the, I won't tell you how old I am, but that was a while ago. And they began having this little saying that we don't mix religion and politics and it's private. That's private. We don't talk about that. It's an old saying. Remember that religion and politics don't mix. But that's not true. Not for the believer. Because as a child of God, how can we have political views outside what our Christian faith and the Word of God say? We can't. God's will permeates and supersedes every aspect of life. He takes precedence over everything and everyone. The separation of church and state, if there was even such a thing, does not mean the separation of God and state. Without God, the state will collapse. That's what's happening right now. They've kicked God out of public schools. They've kicked God out of government. They're kicking God out of the public square. They don't mind if we pray, but we need to keep it in our house or in our church. They don't want us to do it in public because it offends people to see us praying. Isn't that a shame? Without God, the state will collapse. Without accountability to God, what will stop those in authority from saying whatever they think is right is right? Isn't that how it goes? No human law can be higher than God's law. This nation is an experiment in self-government. That's another unique thing about America. Whether that experiment will succeed or fail depends on our faithfulness to this principle. This is the principle. People cannot govern themselves if they have lost the sense of what is right and what is wrong. We govern the country. If we exempt ourselves from that very challenging process, then America will cease to exist, just as other countries before her have ceased to exist. You know, countries don't always last forever. There are many countries that are no longer in existence. 
and usually it was because they sank into immorality. The three most important battles we're fighting in this country right now that every Christian should be fighting is the battle over marriage and family, the battle for religious freedom, and the battle over the right to life. And how these battles end up will have directly to do with if believers get involved in politics and get involved in standing up and making a difference. Oh God, forgive us, Lord, and move on hearts, Lord. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding. Let us see the big picture here, Lord. Lord, if we need exhorting, exhort us. If we need rebuking, rebuke us, Lord. Lord, whatever it takes, Lord, get your people moving. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted to give you one little bit of information. If you're not registered to vote, go get registered. The deadline to register before the primary is October the 6th. I mean, excuse me, July the 28th. And the primary is August the 26th. The deadline to register before the general election is October the 6th. And the election is November the 4th. I investigate every candidate. I talk to them. I ask them pointed questions. I get every bit of information I can. If you want to know who I'm going to vote for, you can ask me afterwards, and I'll tell you. God bless you all. As, uh